Hello, I'm Bhavani Turaisingham from the University of Texas at Dallas, and I'm giving this presentation. It's a recorded presentation, and it will be given as a keynote address at the IEEE Women in Services Computing Symposium in early September. And so my talk is going to be in two parts. One is the technical part, and the other one is a motivational part. And I have around 40 minutes uh, for the presentation. And then I will be present uh, during the meeting. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer the questions. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, yeah. Okay, so it's a fairly long presentation. It's about 38 charts. So some things I'm going to skip fairly quickly. And so the technical part is integrating cybersecurity and artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science with applications in the smart internet of transportation systems. And the second part is the importance of mentoring to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in areas like cybersecurity, data science, cloud, and services computing. Okay, so yes, so the first part, integrating cybersecurity, AI, ML, data science with applications in smart internet of transportation systems. And so this is going to be, again, subdivided into three smaller parts. First is integrating cybersecurity and AI, ML, data science. Second is applying the concepts, uh, secure cyber physical systems and internet of transportation. That's an example. And the third is applying part 1.1 to part 1.2. And that is applications of AI ML data science for smart internet of transportation systems. And I would like to acknowledge several of my colleagues, uh, professors Alvaro Cardenas, Murad Kantajalu, Latifa Khan, and our PhD student, actually he's now doctor, he's graduated, Dr. Raul Quinones, and our project coordinator, Ms. Rhonda Walls. Okay, so there are three main topics I want to talk about, integrating cybersecurity, AI, ML, data science. And one is actually a privacy-aware, policy-based, quantified self data management framework. Sorry that it's like kind of moved it a little up here. So this part is hidden, this data management framework. So the whole idea is that there's so much of information being collected about us, right? And so that's a good thing in many ways because there is this quantified self movement that psychologists are and sociologists are developing. Uh, and so gathering all kinds of information so that we can give guidance to the indi individuals. So wouldn't it be great, like if I go and open my refrigerator, right? And I love vanilla ice cream and milk chocolates. Now I don't have any vanilla ice cream and milk chocolates in my refrigerator, but suppose I have, then I'm going to, you know, it is very hard for me to resist. And so what will happen when I go to eat the chocolates, uh, if the system says that the machine or the refrigerator says, look, you are not supposed to eat chocolates, they're not good for you, right? That would be great. So that's the whole purpose to give advice so that we can live healthier and hopefully happier lives. But there's a big concern because when all this information is being collected, right, your privacy could be violated, right? Because information, health related, fitness data, location data, social media, image video, all kinds of information about us. And so what are we doing? We have developed uh, a data management framework and we are saying policies are at the heart of it. Data collection, data storage and access, data analytics, data sharing, okay? And so some of the data could be in the encrypted backup storage and some in cloud-based services. And so what we are developing is this privacy aware quantified self-manager and this could run on our mobile devices, right? So where do services and cloud com come in? Yes, because we need cloud-based storage and that has to be secure. And then various cloud-based services that, you know, that provide you know, encrypted uh, sh data sharing and results for querying. So it's a service-based paradigm. 
And then this data collection, data storage, data analytics, they could all be developed as a collection of services, right? These are services that are being offered. So what we are saying is that whatever is being collected, data collection, storage, and analytics and sharing, whatever functions, policies have to govern. So it's policy aware data collection, policy aware data storage, policy aware data analytics, and policy aware data sharing. Okay, so for that, we are working with policy experts. Uh, and so because we computer scientists, we come up with some toy TOY policies. So we've got to work with real policy experts in order to develop real world policies for data collection, storage, access, analytics, and sharing. Okay, now that's one aspect. Another aspect in this particular area, so remember I'm in part 1.1, is how do we apply data science for cybersecurity applications, right? So for instance, we have lots of data coming in in forms of streams, so it's big data. Streams are, right, continuous flows of data. They are very common in connected digital world, massive amounts of data, right, data streams. So what do we do? Use past data to build classification model, predict the labels. That's sort of what we have been doing for a long time, right? And predict future instances, and it helps in decision making. So you can ask, what is the challenge? But that's big data and streaming data continuously coming in. So the concepts are going to change. And they are that that's really important because today it could be by Microsoft, tomorrow by Apple, the day after by Google, the next day by Amazon, right? So it's not or then by Facebook. So it's not going to be one thing, it's continuously changing. So what do we do? We build an ensemble of models, right? Collection of models. And some models like yesterday was Microsoft, but today is Apple. So yesterday's model is outdated. So we throw it away and then we replace it by a new model. So we build an ensemble of models, lots of streaming data coming in. It could be network data, traffic data, or we can even apply this to financial uh, stock market data, right? So we are applying this for cybersecurity, lots of intrusion data being collected on network traffic, and some could be benign, some could be malicious, right? So benign traffic we store in a server. So these models are going to analyze, and if it's attack, it's going to block and quarantine, and then we are going to update the models, right? So models are continuously being updated. So we applied this to uh, inside the threat detection because bad people can pretend to be good people and stay inside the machine and do all kinds of horrible stuff. Similarly, you can have also in an organization, bad people pretending to be good people and carrying out espionage. But our focus was on uh, machines, right, systems. And so we have, you know, we uh, uh, applied supervised learning as well as uns unsupervised learning. So what do we do? So I chunks arrive, you know, various sort of patterns uh, that people are typing, and then we collect all the data, gather the chunks, and then we develop and extract features and apply various learning algorithms, uh, unsupervised graph-based anomaly detection and supervised one class or so two types of algorithms, supervised and unsupervised. And then we build an ensemble of models, a collection of models, throw, throw away the old models. And then the I plus one chunk comes in, and of course we test. So the research part here is the ensemble of models. And then we do services come in. Here, what we, are, what we can do is build this data science machine learning as a service, right? Services for cybersecurity application. So again, these machine learning algorithms could be developed as a collection of services. So that way we can have a, a sort of a clean separation between these different models and modules of the system and then offer them as services. And these machine learning services can be applied for cybersecurity applications. Okay, so the other thing that is really worrying the community is what happens if the data science cybersecurity, sorry, data science machine learning algorithms are attacked. Right, because these things, these systems could be attacked as well. Right, so what happens? The adversary, remember, the adversary is trying to figure out what we are doing, looking at our data and trying to thwart our data. The adversary could be a enemy in terms of counterterrorism point of view, or it could be a competitor, right? We say we are a pharmaceutical company and then there is another competitor. They are trying to figure out what we are doing because remember these, blood, these drugs that, you know, like for instance, the COVID-19 vaccines and so on, it's really blockbuster, right? You can make the company billions of dollars. 
And so the adversary is watching, right? They, they might try to thwart us. And these days, many corporations are, de are depending on uh, data science machine learning. And so adversary is trying to figure out what we are doing. So it's not about concept drift. It's not online learning. Adversary adapts to avoid being detected during training time. It could be data poisoning during testing time, modifying the features when the data mining is deployed, and it becomes a game play. So here, the red squares are bad instances, the blue circles are good instances, and this is sort of the support vector machine boundary line. Okay, so look what is happening, right? The adversary is trying to figure out what we are doing, thwart our model, and so some of the bad instances are now being considered to be good instances. And that's not good because what happens, we are going to get false negatives, right? So we have to combat what the adversary is trying to do. So essentially, I think this is a little bit uh, because my picture is uh, on the side. So what is happening here, the cybersecurity service, because machine learning systems are being attacked. And so we are providing cybersecurity. We could provide the cybersecurity features as a service right, to help with the machine learning algorithms, right, to secure the machine learning algorithms. So here it's cybersecurity as a service, where the previous case we said machine learning as a service. Okay, so again, continuing with this example, a threat model, you know, we can do deployed time attacks, attacker modifies X2X prime, uh, you can modify the packet length by adding dummy bytes or good word to spam email, add noise to an image, and so all these red squares, uh, crosses are bad instances, the green circles are good instances, and this is a support vector machine line. But what we are trying to do is to try to combat what the adversary, try to learn what the adversary is doing, and moving this line, the blue line, is the new support vector machine. Okay, so black dash line is a standard support vector machine boundary, and the blue line is adversarial support vector machine. So when you move the blue line, some of these red crosses which are, you know, sort of bad instances, right? So, so, so what happens is that, see, earlier what the adversary is trying to do is to push, right? So earlier, the bad instances would have been not, they would not have been caught, but by moving this line, the bad instances are now being caught. But you can ask the question, we can move this blue line right up here, right? And so when that's the case, then all the bad instances would be caught, but then the good instances would also be, uh, no, I mean, we, we, may, we may conclude that the good instances are also bad and we don't want that. We don't want false positives. We don't want false negatives. And so the research is where do you move this line? Okay, so this is sort of our work on integrating AI and data science with cybersecurity and bringing in services. We've also done some work on using cloud for information sharing. So a lot of the things that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, I have discussed in various papers and so on. And so I, I'll be happy to answer these questions uh, during the meeting, during the conference. Uh, and so these are the key points. Now, 1.2 is security for Internet of Transportation Systems. So what is Internet of Things? We know our refrigerator collect, connected to our television, connected to our computers, our cell mobile phones and our radios and televisions and the whole lot, right? So similarly for Internet of Transportation, all of the cars, the vehicles are connected to the trains, to the trucks and to the roadworks. And the whole idea is to make life easy for us, right? And so what have we done? Imagine if these, these systems are attacked because they're all communicating. If this is attacked, it could be really critical because there could be massive accidents and massive crashes and explosions. And so that's the problem. So what have we done? Uh, so we have looked at it's a huge business, by the way, autonomous vehicles, right? Many companies like General Motors and so on, they're investing heavily. So what we have done with these attacks, a very simple uh, algorithm to build a reference monitor, that's the security critical components using a physics-based anomaly detection that's called PBAD algorithm for ground and aerial vehicles, right? The algorithm will consist of three parts. You build a model offline of the AV's physical invariance implementing an online tool to monitor expected and observed behavior. And if there's any uh, re significant residual difference, then it'll raise an alarm. So offline pre-processing, online verification, and anomaly detection. So you might think, so what's the big deal, right? It's very straightforward. Yes, but the whole idea, the challenge for us 
is to build a physical model. And I haven't really discussed that in this presentation, uh, but we have a number of papers uh, like the Usenet security in 2020. So uh, what we do here is building a model offline of the AV's physical invariance. That is the technical challenge. So comp we computer scientists, right? We cannot build these models because the control systems engineers and so on. So Dr. Cardenas is an expert in control systems security. So he was responsible. He and his student built the model. I gave inputs for the uh, for the anomaly detection. But again, we can use sophisticated machine learning. But in this case, we just used a simple extended Kalman filter. It's not simple, but it's been around for a while. And so we implemented uh, use that for. Uh, detecting the anomalies. Okay, so it's the physics space. Physics again, we have to model the physical properties. And so, our physical implementation, we did it for aerial vehicles, right? Like the drones, uh, controller is PX4, ready to uh, fly controller focused on uh, GPS spoofing. Those are the attacks and gyroscope attacks. GPS attacks are detected in 0 0.2 seconds, while gyroscope attacks 1.5, and overhead was 5.43. We did it for aerial drones as well as for ground vehicles. We didn't do it for uh, sea vehicles, right? Because uh, this is sort of, you know, less difficult for us. We didn't have an ocean or we don't, you know, we didn't want to go to the lake to do the experiments. Anyway, ground AV custom built on top of Praxis Ford Fiesta. Uh, Rally Chase controller is ROS Kinetic Cam focused on detecting visual attacks on the camera, attacks detected after 0 0.1 seconds, overhead introduced is 2.25%. Each threshold produces a probability of false alarms, approximately 2%. So that's our implementation. So that's very briefly, I talked about what we did for Internet of Transportation. Okay, now part three, right, is uh, applying AI ML data science for smart Internet of Transportation systems. Okay, so one is data science AI for transportation system security. So these are all sort of stuff in the future. Remember, what we did for insider threat, right? This is our picture here. So how can we apply that for transportation? So internet of transportation systems are subject to attacks. So earlier I talked about how we applied in a physics based model and applying Kalman filter. So how can we bring in AI techniques? Streaming data being collected, right? So internet of transportation is lots of sensor data, lots of communication data. So its data is coming in streams. Again, as transportation systems go electric, we need energy, energy conservation. Threats to the security of such systems could cause massive damage, right? Accidents, loss of lives, as well as, you know, stranded on lonely highways due to attacks on energy management. Data science, machine learning techniques are being applied to analyze the data. So the question is, can the stream analytics that we discussed earlier, can they be applied? So we can apply them to intrusion data, financial data. How can we apply them for? transportation data. The main question is to understand the nature of the complex transportation data and adapt our stream anal uh, analytics techniques. Because again, massive amounts of heterogeneous data are being collected. That's one point. The second point, remember the adversarial machine learning that I mentioned, right? Can we apply this, right? What happens if the machine learning techniques we are applying that I discussed here, if they are attacked, right? So Internet of Transportation will also heavily depend on, because we need machine learning. Why? Because we want to give better advice to the drivers, tell them where the congestions are. So a lot of things that we want to give help to the drivers, right? But that, that's going to cause privacy concerns, right? So especially if you're driving without a, a human in the loop, then we need machine learning techniques. So the Sorry, we'll be learning the models used by the vehicles, the machine learning models the vehicles are using and learn. Adversary will attempt to thwart the vehicle's learning process. Therefore, the learning algorithms have to adapt to thwart the adversary's actions, right? Eventually, just like earlier, it becomes game playing between the adversary and the vehicle's machine learning algorithm. So what's the challenge? What sort of game is being played? Is it zero sum? Is it Bayesian? Is it Stackelberg? So we have to understand the data. And research is only beginning on this topic, right? Applying adversarial machine learning, integrating with Internet of Transportation Systems. Okay, now, remember I talked about our smartphone and data collection, data storage, analytics, and sharing. Instead of a smartphone, now we have a car, right? And the data is radar, GPS, cameras, leader, ultrasonic, some data stored in cloud, and some anonymized data and cloud-based services. And so developing a privacy aware autonomous vehicle, right? So 
we, we are saying policy-based data collection, policy-based data storage, policy-based data analytics, policy-based data sharing, and all of these functions could be offered as collection of services. We haven't done this yet, but what I'm saying is what we talked about earlier for our healthcare data and social media data and so on, can we apply those technologies and techniques to radar, GPS, cameras, and data and apply policy and develop policy-based solutions? So that's the that's the future. Okay, so privacy, we have policy-based data management framework for internet of transportation. Finally, what are the summary, so the summary and directions, right? So again, developments in secure, secure AI, integrating cybersecurity, AI, data science, machine learning, exploding, applications of, for security like insider threat detection and security for AI, adversarial machine learning. In the first case, we are developing machine learning, data science, AI as a collection of services. In the second case, we are developing security technologies, right? As a collection of services to apply for AI systems. Also developments in privacy aware healthcare management once activities, that's the privacy aware quantified self. At the same time with the Internet of Transportation, right, the infrastructure security privacy solutions are being developed. And these are mainly what I explained, physics-based solutions. We model using physical properties and then uh, we apply Kalman filter. So question is, as driverless cars become a reality, more and more of the autonomous vehicles will use AI ML techniques. How can we develop AI solutions to detect malware in AV systems, right? So just like we detected malware for network traffic, malware for AV systems. And second, what happens if the data science AI techniques are attacked? So we got to come up with adversarial machine learning for AV systems. And can we develop a privacy aware policy-based data management framework for internet of transportation and integration with services and the cloud? Because cloud and services are going to play a major role when we integrate cybersecurity and AI, especially for internet of transportation, internet of things. Numerous opportunities for substantial research. Okay, so that's the first part and thank all my colleagues. And by the way is, yeah, Dr. Rolf Quinones. I've got it correct here. Now, the second part, since I'm addressing women in services computing, uh, so I'd like to talk about the importance of mentoring to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in areas like cloud, services computing, data science, and machine learning, okay? So these are the areas I work in. So, okay, so, men so again, I've got it in two parts. One, how can we mentor? And this is the, my motivational part of my talk to support diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what is diversity? I got it from the source Ford Foundation. Even many universities, you know, they're talking about diversity, equity. Many web pages are talking about in organizations that they support DEI, which is good. So I took it from this uh, definition. Diversity, again, is a representation of all our varied identities, right? It doesn't regardless of the race, ethnicity, gender, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, caste, social economic status, thinking, and communication styles. So diverse groups of people, right? We've got to involve diverse groups of people. Second, equity seeks to ensure fair treatment. So once we have diversity, right, we, everyone, there has to be equity, fair treatment for all, because you want to hire people from diverse group, provided they are qualified. Again, diversity means get the inputs, right? If you, are, uh, uh, if you are, have a job um, posting, you want to make sure you've got good candidates, right, from a variety of groups. That's the, that's the thing. But of course, you've got to hire the best qualified candidate. Equity, once you hire, you need to give all the opportunities, equal opportunity. Inclusion builds a culture of belonging, right? You don't want to sort of select a particular group. You need to include everyone. So this is really crucial in order to have a more civilized and inclusive and diverse and equitable society. Okay, so why do I believe mentoring is so important? And I'm going to give my own examples in one's career because we are living in a complex world, rapidly evolving, worldwide web social media have eliminated boundaries and social norms. With COVID-19, the work environment has drastically changed, right? Numerous career opportunities in computer science in general, cybersecurity, AI, cloud uh, services in particular, right? but competition is also increasing, right? Because when I started my career in 1940 years ago, right? The competition, although, uh, the jobs were not as great, right? There were opportunities in computer science, not as um, many as we have now, 
But then the competition also was not as uh, tough as it's now. It's almost impossible for a person to work in his, in his career, succeed, without the advice and mentorship of senior researchers, developers, technologies, professors, and so on. Almost every person I've known who has succeeded has had a mentor. In many cases, mentors, right, who have guided him, her, and supported him during the early stages of his career. Therefore, every career professional, regardless of age, even now, I've got 40 years of experience, work experience, but still mentoring is very, very helpful. And my mentor doesn't have to be older than me, right? You know, so there are some people who are 15 years younger to me, I still get advice from them, right? So regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, and age. So why do women and underrepresented minorities, why do we struggle, all right, in, in, in our careers? And part of the reason, I'll say a main reason, lack of mentorship is perhaps the most important reason that women and minority communities have not done as well in their careers, right? Lack of opportunities start at an early age. Boys are given preferences over girls in almost every culture. And as time progresses, girls are left behind in schools. Fortunately, I came from an all girls family uh, with a lot of sisters, no brothers. And so my parents paid a lot of attention to all, our, all of us. So women, but if, if I had had brothers, I, I'm almost certain my brothers would have gotten preferences in terms of education. So women mainly work to supplement their husband's incomes. Minority communities also have tremendous disadvantages. Often parents are not as educated as those from non-minority communities because they haven't had the advantages that the non-minority communities have had. And so minority boys and girls have a huge handicap. If the women and minority communities are fortunate enough to get an education and a good job, there are very few from these communities who are at a higher position, right? And so junior researchers, developers, technologists are often ignored and left to fend for themselves. And they see their non-minority colleagues thrive, possibly due to extensive mentoring they get, and get frustrated and, get, and that becomes a vicious cycle, right? So the first step is to realize there is a problem. People, especially those in minority communities, they do not understand there is a problem. They say, oh, you know, you, you have jobs and it's, it's, it's a, what they call unconscious bias. And that does exist, okay? Uh, affirmative action programs have been around for a long time, but these programs do not sort of attempt to support the genuine growth of women and minorities and have been frowned upon because, oh, she's getting that because she's a woman. In fact, I got a Woman of Color Research um, Leadership Award and one of my colleagues said, oh, it's not fair. You are a woman, so you are, you are a woman of color. You are getting it and essentially implied that he's a white male and he's not getting that award, right? But again, being a white male, I'm sure he's got many, many more privileges than me as a woman of color. Thanks to the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter, people are getting more educated about the problem and we must empower everyone. As a result, there's much more awareness about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not about giving a job to a person because she's a woman. It's not about that. It's about building a safe and inclusive environment and giving the opportunity so that everyone can thrive, right? I hope that these are not just words, that all of us can work together to handle the challenges that women and minority communities are faced today. And we must not only focus on the advancement of women, which is a must, because women are 50% of the world, right? The community. So it's a must. But also we have to include every disadvantaged community, African-American, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, LGBTQ, people with disability, elderly. And again, we have to go beyond our race, ethnicity and help everyone to succeed. Okay, so my personal story, and I've got, to, you know, I, I'll finish in about 10 minutes so we can maybe have a discussion. Back in the early to mid 90s, okay, I was in my mid to late 30s, okay, and thriving doing technical work. The general impression was Bhavani is very good in her work due to my outstanding publications far above everyone else at the time. I was in a research, uh, research and develop research center, and the ability to establish projects, including you know getting funding and so on. So then there was a highly visible position opening up at work, and I was interested. I felt that I had all the credentials, but hardly anyone higher up thought of me as a contender. Perhaps it's what I call an unconscious bias, okay? Fortunately, one lady who had worked with me, she was only a few years older to me, recognized my talent. I was so fortunate, right, to have her and my capability, and she recommended me for the position. There was one other person, and we'll call that person, let's say X, who was also competing for the position. And I was told by this lady that X's supporters were undermining me, okay? This lady who was, who was, you know, really my strong supporter. 
she her heard comments like, oh, Bhavani is a loner. Bhavani is not a team player. Bhavani is not that great technically, even though my research publications, you know, in top tier venues, far better than anyone else, right? And I was also leading multiple research teams. So my managers who wanted me to get the position, they were puzzled about these com comments. They did defend me, but this lady uh, felt I needed to provide more evidence of my excellence, right? Which very likely may not have been for say a white male or maybe even a white woman, right? We don't know, but very likely. If not for this lady who wanted uh, to support me strongly, I, would, I wouldn't have known there was a problem. Right. And I might have gotten rejected for that position and I would have gotten, you know, upset. So then when she told me I acted, I contacted my mentor from UC Berkeley, the late Professor C. C. V. Ramamurthy, which is so wonderful. Right. I call, we call him uh, Professor Ram. Um, and so we so one evening we strategized for hours. What do we do? Right. And so we said, OK, so why don't we get letters from all these sponsors? So I got letters from sponsors who were high up in the US government and research organization. And almost all of them, I think all of them I got letters were white males, right? Very, very supportive of me. And so I, I also asked someone higher up in the organization, a wonderful person, a man, uh, a white man to support me. And he did. So within a work, within a week, my main boss, who really wanted to help me, but he was puzzled. Why are they saying all these bad things, right? So he got these numerous letters. Uh, from very, very important people, right? And that I was, how great I was, not only how great I was in my research and research work and technically how good I was, what an asset I was to them and what a team player I was and what a mentor I was because I was mentoring some of the junior researchers in their organizations. So they also mentored, right? So these junior researchers, so when I was in my early to mid thirties, sorry, mid to late thirties, they were in their early to mid twenties. So my boss was very happy. So he was able to make a strong case and I got this position. So I was around 38 at the time and that was very crucial for my career. Soon after that, again, thanks to Professor Ram, he was my mentor. I got nominated for awards, IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award and IEEE Fellow. And then when you get one thing, you know, it's like the rich getting richer, right? So today I have a very strong support system and great colleagues like Elisa Bertino, Professor Daphne Yao, Professor Ling Liu, and uh, Professor Yiling Yan. Uh, so these are all my colleagues and many more, right? Um, and so I'm a fellow of ACM, IEEE, AAAS, and I, uh, National Academy of Inventors, and lots of, uh, lots of um, <clears throat> awards and, uh, and so on. Uh, again, it's not a one-way street. I support them also, right? So I support these colleagues like Professor Bertino, Professor Yao, Professor Ling Liu, Professor Yiling Yan, all of them, and they support me. It's a two-way thing. Okay, so what have I learned from my experience? So again, okay, timing is good. I was very fortunate because this lady happened to be working with me and she was a couple of years senior to me, okay? And senior in position as well. We cannot depend, I, I was lucky. We cannot depend on luck. We have to make every effort to get a member, mentor from day one, regardless of whether we are in high school, college or in the workforce. That's why I become a strong mentor now, not just to junior faculty, junior researchers, uh, also to um, my students, my PhD students, my master's students, and so on, and uh, undergraduates more recently, and also more recently, high school students. So, so all summer, I mentored nine high school students. Okay, so, so we must talk to senior per people, not one, but many, and see who will be willing to be our mentor, and also see whether we have a good rapport with him, her. Ever since that experience, I've always had a mentor, even to this day, but I've also been a mentor to many people, right? So, because I un understand how, how one feels and motivate and encourage them. Why there's a tendency for me to mentor women, right? Because remember, we are comfortable with people that are like us, right? And I feel that women, we sort of bond, right? Because we have, even though we all come from different, uh, you know, diverse cultures and so on, but as women, I found that regardless whether you are South Asian or East Asian or Caucasian or African or whatever, Middle Eastern, we kind of bond, right, uh, with each other. So, uh, but I've also been a mentor to men of all races as well, but it's mostly women. I have worked hard to recruit, often through my colleagues, to get PhD students who are women from the minority communities, LGBTQ, 
And so out of the 23 students, uh, PhD students, I would have graduated between 2005 and 2022, hopefully next year, at least 50%, I think 12 are women. And I also have from African-American, Hispanic-American and LGBTQ. But I believe I need to do a lot more for the minority communities. I need to have more African-Americans, more Hispanic-Americans and more from LGBTQ communities. And my, the women are from all, you know, all uh, ethnic origins. So I benefit a great deal from mentoring and learning from the mentees. Okay, advice to mentors, very briefly. First and foremost, junior faculty and researchers are coming to you because you're successful. So likely you are in this position because there was someone who must have helped you sometime in your, in your career. So don't forget, when a junior faculty needs mentorship, please be there for them. If it is hard for you due to time commitment, please try and connect to others. Mentoring can be very rewarding and uplifting. Once you start mentoring, it can bring you great joy seeing your mentees thrive. It's almost like being a parent, right? I'm a parent and I'm also a grandparent. And so it's just wonderful, right? To see your, uh, you know, your children do very well. So just like that, mentorship can be very rewarding. Together you can work with a mentee on the research areas he she should, could work on. You have more experience, so you can give him advice, challenging problems and so on. And uh, if he has potential in management, encourage him to become a department head. Because again, remember, the more women department heads we have, right, then we can have more deans, right? If you have 10 department heads, nine men and one woman, then the chances of anyone making to the dean the woman would be slim because there's a larger pool for the men, right? So if you have five men and five women, or seven women and three men, of course, the chances of women get becoming deans and then from deans to provost to president or in companies, directors and vice presidents and president is higher. We need more department heads from female and minority communities. And that's what I'm saying. Perhaps 10 department head positions for one dean position, right? So you need 10 women to get one dean, right? So 10 deans to get one provost. So also the mentees who are likely younger may give some breakthrough ideas because I find that some of the younger people I mentored, they are really much stronger than me these days technically because they are younger, right? They have brighter ideas. So then they tell me something, then I, then I have more experience. So we work very well together. Okay. To mentees, please be patient. Do everything you can to find mentors and work with them. But your mentor is not a psychologist. Don't go and start crying to them and saying all oh, the problems you have, oh, your husband is not is mean to you or this, that and the other. No, it's a working, professional working arrangement. Plan on what you will be discussing with your mentor. Focus on education and career, not complain about colleagues or about your spouse. Once you develop a rapport with your mentor, it's most rewarding. If there's a new position you want to be considered, discuss with your mentor, it's the right position and uh, how you might go about getting the position. If the mentor is not encouraging, you need to ask why. Why is he or she not encouraging? Good to set up a time, say once a week, 30 minutes. Also, you have you, uh, once you have gotten all what you can from your mentor and you are successful, never forget your mentor, right? Never forget how you got where you are. That's what many, many of us forget, right? That there was always someone helping us. This does not mean you have to do whatever your mentor wants. Again, don't allow your mentor to sort of abuse you. That's, that's, that's a bad relationship, but you need, you, need, you need to show respect, right? And the last chart in this part, I got a few more charts and uh, I'll finish very quickly. Every organization must have policies for diversity, DEI. However, we cannot just arbitrarily bring people just because you know we can't just go and bring a woman or a minority person walking on the street, join the company. They have to be technically good, right? With respect to multiple dimensions, technical management, leadership, good mentoring will enable a person to understand the culture of the organization and what it takes to succeed and then pursue a plan of action, such as taking courses, working on degrees and so on. Right. So uh, the organization must ensure that every individual is given access to mentoring support, right, regardless of the person's background. That is, mentoring is essential to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? We need domain specific mentors, right? We, computer science, cybersecurity, cloud services, data science, we understand, right, the area, right? So psychologists are good, but they are more generally. So we need specialists. Great. Now, very briefly, why a career in cloud services computing that includes data science, cybersecurity for women and underrepresented minorities, right? So we need more women and underrepresented minorities in cloud services computing. There are so many opportunities in these areas, yet so few women. Now I know the numbers in cybersecurity, only around 10% in cybersecurity are women, uh, even fewer for minority communities and about 20% in data science AI, a little better. Numbers in cloud computing and services seems to be similar, 
uh, but I don't have the exact numbers. Something we need to uh, make uh, make a you know make an effort to get the exact numbers. Uh, women and those from minority communities are losing out intellectually, but also financially. We urgently need mentors to motivate the members from these diverse communities, and we can do it if we can all work together, right? So, what are the challenges faced by uh, you know by the women, minorities, and transgender? We face challenges because we are minority, right? We don't have the numbers to represent us, even especially at the highest levels. Even those who have made it to the top are sometimes reluctant to support them in case they are perceived badly by their peers. So often we hear, hear women go to the top, but they don't help other women. Remember, your peers are always supporting people who are like them, right? So if there are men, they are supporting men, right? So if you're, say, sort of white men, they are supporting white men and South Asian men supporting South Asian men and East Asian men supporting East Asian younger men and so on. So if we don't support people who are like us, who else is going to? Why not nurture and support those who have no voice or a piece of the pie. So while there are some efforts now to support women, and I think limited efforts to underrepresented communities, hardly any for LGBTQ, especially transgender. The transgender community is the most discriminated communities I found, and we all need to do more. And we must support all types of diversity, neurodiversity, autistic communities. So, okay, now my top 10 reasons. Why career and cloud services for women and underrepresented? One. Given the opportunity, women, underrepresented minorities, they can excel in any computing field, cloud or services, cybersecurity, you name it, right? An exciting field with so many innovations. Two, it can be integrated with many areas, arts, humanities, natural science, social science, and so on. Three, there are many options from research and academia to, pro to product development, to startups with substantial funding. Four, millennial women, underrepresented communities and beyond, they have the flexibility and freedom to choose careers, right? And they have more role models than us. See, I'm a baby, right in the middle of the baby boomer generation, right in the middle. But we didn't have all those support, right? But I'm better off than women say 10 years older to me, right? So they paved the way for me and hopefully I'm paying them paving the way for others. In May 5, many research areas you can work from home most days, but you know, after, after COVID, I think most of us can work from home, but like professors, right? We've got to go and you know, teach our students. So five is not as much after COVID. I'm not so sure about five, but still, right? You can do research at home. It is intellectually six challenging and keeps us motivated. Seven, many cybersecurity data science jobs cannot be overtaken by robots, right? Because eventually, say, medical jobs could be taken, right? Giving uh, diagnosis. But cybersecurity data science, we need people like us to develop the systems. Cloud services computing are high, number eight, highly paid fields and numerous job opportunities. So why not us take advantage? Female underrepresented minorities can be fine, financially independent with a career in cloud services computing. And I've told women, especially for a woman, okay, having financial independence is a must for every woman, as well as those underrepresented minority communities. Women, especially, it's important because, again, I'm talking from a pers you know, personal or professional, right? If, say, you are in a personal relationship where your spouse, man, is mean to you or not treating you well, you can always walk out of the relationship, right? If you are financially independent, many women put up with abusive behavior. Why? Because they don't have the financial resources. So that is why I always tell every woman, financial independence is a must. 10, computing systems everywhere from north to south, east to west, you know, they can be attacked. So again, when you work in cybersecurity data science, you can develop so many technologies and it's a major problem. Again, I've, I've, I'm looking at uh, applying these technologies for violence against women and children. And I gave some talks uh, about a year ago on this topic. Okay, so what can IEEE services, my last chart, I think one before the last, what can we do for the community uh, to support DEI? So I worked in data and application security privacy since fall 85, intersection of cybersecurity and data science. And since the early 2000s in cloud and services computing, the good news is services computing community has had multiple women pioneers, right? Look at our, our program committees and our steering committee and our general chair, you know, uh, she's a wonderful, you know, and our program chair chairs, I mean, they are all highly accomplished uh, uh, women and uh, really talented. So that's the good news. 
However, women are still not still only a small percentage and I, I don't think I, I see I've attended many services computing conferences and I, I see mostly men, so we need to look at the exact numbers. And we need to do much better with the underrepresented minority communities. I see more women than my minority communities. These communities are vastly underrepresented in cloud computing and services. And again, when I talk about minorities, underrepresented, I talk about the United States perspective, right? Every country has got underrepresented minorities also. So that's one of the reasons I think it's easier to talk about women in international conferences because it's global, right? You are either man or a woman, or these days we have also other, but mostly there are men or women, right? And so, uh, so there are many, many women around, right? So for underrepresented minorities, it's difficult for, you know, talk about DEI in different countries, it's different. And they say it takes a village to raise a child. And I say it takes the world to address diversity, equity, inclusion. Each one of us must do our part in whatever way we can, and we need the support of the majority communities. Okay, in conclusion, my last chart, from equity talk to equity walk. This is a book I just finished reading. Uh, authors, please read. It's a very, very useful book for diversity, equity, inclusion. Authors are Tia brown McNair, Estella Mara, Ben Simon and Lindsay Malcolm Piquet, Piquet, or Piquet, John Wiley and Sons, it was 2020. And again, as they say, we must walk the walk, not just talk the talk, don't just talk, show it in action. And if we all work together. So I'm very grateful to the conference, the symposium organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And I think I kept it uh, around, uh, let's see, 45 minutes. So. And I think that's it. And I'm going to stop sharing. And as I said, I will be um, at the conference, right? And I'm really looking forward to meeting you all at the conference. And then I will be happy to answer the questions, OK? And once again, thank you very much. And let's hope that we will all work together to support women, as well as the underrepresented minorities, whatever country we are from, right? We have our own minority community and also we have to support the women. Thank you very much and see you soon, okay? Bye.